Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. This is Erica Bernstein, and I work here in the Office of Training and Exercises at the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. And we are pleased to welcome all of you to this morning's webinar, Managing Unsolicited Donations and Undesignated Cash in Disasters. Just a few ground rules for today. Because of the large number of callers, we will be muting all participant lines during the session. So if you have any questions during the session, please do ask them. We just ask that you use the chat feature, which is below the list of participants. Simply type in your question, and they will be answered in the same format. If you would rather ask questions or make your comments verbally, we ask you to hold those until Amanda takes breaks for questions throughout the presentation or until the end of the presentation. Um, to ask a question verbally, we'll, we, we will ask you to use the raise your hand button, which is also located directly below the list of participants. We will then recognize you individually by name and unmute your line. At the end, there will be a brief survey hosted directly through the webinar um, where we'll be asking for feedback on this topic as well as suggestions for future topics. So we would very much appreciate you staying just a minute after the webinar to complete this survey. As you heard the announcement, this session will be recorded and a link will be provided to everyone within about a week or so after this presentation. Our presenter for today is Amanda Reidelbach. She joined the Virginia Department of Emergency Management in September 2013 as a Disaster Relief and Volunteers Coordinator. Prior to joining VDEM, she worked for Louisa County from 2006 to 2012. Following the 2011 earthquake that struck that locality, she worked with local community leaders in establishing the Louisa Earthquake Recovery Fund and the Louisa County Long-Term Recovery Group. She now uses the lessons learned during that disaster's response and recovery to assist local governments in volunteers and donations management. She also administers the Virginia Disaster Relief Fund. She relies, resides in Louisa County with her husband and their two young children where they enjoy the country life. Amanda, take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, okay, I see that. Sorry, I was waiting for my icon to come up. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to talk today about how to manage um, unsolicited donations and undesignated cash. So at any time when I really start talking about donations, I am referring to the unsolicited donations, the, uh, the donations that, that just show up into a locality after an event, um, or the unsolicited um, cash where you're not asking for cash, it comes into a locality and you're not sure where it should go or how it should be used. So when I talk about money um, or donations, those are the two, two things that I will be talking about today. Um, so our objectives are to um, describe to you why cash donations are really more economically feasible than donated goods, um, list and define locations that are required for your donation management process, define some of the requirements for collection centers, um, and describe to you why cash is the best of all potential donations. i also talk about the process of referring cash to appropriate funds, what type of funds um, you can either establish within your locality or your community, um, or to which organizations um, it's recommended that you refer cash donations to. I wanted to, I found this really interesting uh, online article where it talks about the, the 10 worst things to donate after a disaster. Um, and I wanted to share some of those things and some of the images with you all so you could get an idea of the, the overwhelming nature of donations management, how it can come into your locality um, and be the second disaster um, if you are not prepared or organized um, for, for that event to come in. So the, the, one of the worst things is clothing. Um, people just feel that individuals have lost everything, um, and the only thing that they have after an event are the clothes on their back. So they look into their own closet and say, oh, I've got to give them clothes. Um, but clothes really hinder the recovery effort because it requires um, substantial amount of sorting, um, and organizing, it takes up space, and it requires a lot of labor to go through that. Um, and uh, according to FEMA, who has done some studies on donations that have come into disaster areas, it is rarely the used. And, and the vast majority of the clothes that come into a uh, community end up in the landfill which then becomes another hindrance for the locality because you're now taking up precious landfill space um, with items that, that came in. 
So, so clothing really can can overwhelm you. Another thing, it's really along the same line as clothing, but it's shoes. People think again, the only thing they have are are the shoes on their feet, and they may have um, gone through floodwaters and um, different disaster um, stricken um, contaminants. Um, so we've got to give you shoes. Um, and again, it can just become become really difficult. Um, and it's beware of the myth that everything is needed. Um, a lot of times people will get on to media and say, we need everything. Um, and that can, can really flood um, your community with items that aren't very useful. Um, blankets. Um, people think, oh, uh, you have shelters that need to be stood up and, and people need warm blankets. It will comfort them. Um, but the reality is is that most voluntary organizations, um, as well as localities that are preparing for shelter operations, you have that on supply. Um, you also have contracts in place to bring in the materials that are needed to manage your shelters. Um, so blankets can, again, become another thing that will overwhelm um, your donation management system. Um, but they, they come in, so you, you can be prepared um, for it. And the reason I, I'm bringing up all these things is to help you write some of your messaging prior to the event to get your information out to the media of what you don't need. Um, you don't need clothes, you don't need shoes, you don't need blankets. Um, but these are just some examples. Um, after the Newtown shooting a few years ago, um, that community was um, flooded with teddy bears and toys. Um, people want to, the people who donate are doing it with the absolute best intentions. They want to help. Um, they want to give some level of comfort, but that individual who wants to help does not realize that there are hundreds or thousands of other individuals just like them, um, and they all send things into the same place, um, and it needs to be managed. Um, one of the statistics for the teddy bears is that for that vigil that they had, um, that the attendees were um, outnumbered by teddy bears. Um, there was 7,000 teddy bears that were shipped in, um, and it took a 20,000 square foot warehouse um, to store all the stuffed animals that came into Newtown. Um, medicine is another item that comes in, um, and you can obviously understand all of the uh, dangers of that, whether it's labeled properly, whether it's been tampered, um, how do you handle it? Is it being distributed? Are you, you know, who's hand, who's distributing it? Is it going to the right person? Are there other medical conditions that it could um, negatively interact with? But medicine does come into your um, disaster area after an event. Um, pet supplies. Um, one of the best organizations for you to get to know um, is the American Humane Society um, because they're going to be the agency you're going to co want to coordinate with. Um, and they have the resources, the logistics, the volunteers, the know-how on how to handle pet supplies. Um, so a lot of times those big bags of dog food and cat food and other equipment will come in, um, and you can quickly refer that off to the American Humane Society. So if you make a connection with them um, now prior to an event, you'll know how to do that referral process quickly um, so that your donations management warehouse um, or collection center doesn't get filled with pet supplies. Um, mixed items. This is probably the most common um, picture or event that you um, have seen if you've had a, a disaster in your own community um, where people just don't necessarily know what to give, so they're going to clean out their garage, and they're going to send you everything. And they're going to send you blenders and toasters and clothes and shoes and water and food and TVs and VCRs and, and just about everything. And that really becomes very difficult to manage because it all has to be inventoried, um, sorted, and then redistributed. Um, canned food and bottled water. Um, contrary to belief um, that this is not necessarily something that is needed um, in a disaster area in the manner in which most individuals think. Um, it's best for you and your public messaging 
to get the information out to the public that should they wish to give canned food or bottled water, then they should do it to a food bank and that you are coordinating with those local or regional food banks. Um, when they come directly into your uh, donations warehouse and collection centers, they become another item that needs to be sorted and stored. Um, bottled water is probably the least needed donation um, because local government, state governments, federal government, as well as the voluntary sector have water supplies um, as well as contracts in place to get water um, to people. So it becomes, again, just another challenge um, of having to manage in your donations management process. Um, if any of you on the on the call um, about a month ago, two, three weeks ago, something to that effect, um, we had another webinar that dealt with um, unaffiliated volunteers, um, and that is another uh, donation that comes into your community that is very um, difficult to um, manage if you are not prepared, um, because you get a, a flood of individuals, again, that want to help just as the individuals want to give something to help the survivors, um, and they just don't realize um, the, the needs, the training, the safety, um, the logistics of emergency management and disaster response. So volunteers and unsolicited help is another thing that can come into your, your um, community. Um, and then this picture, they used it online. I thought it may have given a little bit of the wrong connotation of the money to the wrong people. It's not that the Red Cross are the wrong people by any means. They very much are the right people to give money to. But the idea behind this is that you want money to go to a known organization and not these fly-by-night um, relief funds um, or disaster aid programs. Um, that are not connected to larger voluntary organizations um, or connected or affiliated through the local and state government entities. Um, so a lot of money becomes um, wasted um, and, and stolen in disaster response, um, and they get directed um, and don't actually help the survivors. Um, so that was really just kind of a quick overview of the top ten things that come into your locality that you need to be prepared for. Um, and understand that based on the, the scope and, and scale of your disaster, um, you can get a whole lot or maybe not so much of, of many of these items, but you will probably see all of them um, at some level after an event. So why is cash more economical? The example that I have here is that somebody wants to donate a can of spinach. That can then has to be packaged. They, they, the, the individual has a uh, food drive. They gather all the cans up, all the food up, and they have to package it. They then have to put it on a truck and have to ship it. They then have to move it to a location and offload it. It goes into a warehouse, collection center, needs to be um, sorted, needs to be repackaged, needs to be uh, put into bundles that can be distributed, and then it eventually hits the public and it hits the survivor. So that one can of food has to go through all of those steps um, for donations management, and each one of those steps costs something, and that's money. Um, and statistically, there's, there's some information that that one can of food throughout the entire stage costs $10. So the amount of money for packaging, for shipping, for uh, the, the volunteer hours or the um, individuals that you may have to pay um, through emergency management that go into that, it, it comes out to $10 a can where you could go buy it for $0.80. Cents. So getting the message out um, that money is best is really critical. Um, that will help you. Uh, manage the process and manage the flow. But the reality is, is that even though you say, no, we don't want anything, we don't need anything, goods will still come and a facility to manage those goods will still be required. Oh, got a, a fancy little transition there. Sorry about that. Um, so a donation supply chain. In a small event, 
um, you have unsolicited donations. You've got the goods, which are in green. And they come into your community and they go to a collection center. They go to one facility. Everything comes in there. Um, your collection center can gather it all um, and move it to a distribution center. So there is a sorting process that goes on between the collection and the distribution center. Um, it, it becomes ready for public consumption, and then it's given to the survivors. Um, you can, in small events, have a collection center and distribution center housed in the same facility, um, though you really do want to separate those programs. Um, put up a wall, put up a sheet, ha you know, if it's a big um, gymnasium, uh, community center, you need to do something to separate the two areas because you do not want your survivors coming in to get materials to help them in their recovery and then see items coming off the truck and say, oh, there's a bicycle, I would really like that for my son. You have to control the flow of... Um, the flow of, of material so that people can, can get what you are um, prepared to give them. Um, and a, a collection center is just the definition, is just a public site for collecting the unsolicited goods. It can be a community center, it can be a church, it can be a vacant uh, storefront. Um, anywhere that you can um, lock it, um, provide some sort of security um, and manage it, management. Um, some of the best locations are going to be places where you can move large trucks, box trucks, or even tractor trailers in and out, something that has good ingress and egress. Um, that you can manage that flow. Um, another thing that I have learned in this is that you may even want to need enough space to be able to put a dumpster nearby because there will be items coming into the collection center that aren't even um, of a quality that you want to sort it. You know right away that this is trash um, and you can, can throw it right into the trash. Um, and the, the collection center um, is about converting stuff into goods. Um, and this is just an, an acronym for, for what stuff means. And it means surplus, trash, useless to frantic folks. So it's all the mixed items that come in. Um, and sadly, a good majority of that is trash um, and will end up in your landfill. But you're converting it into goods. And goods are gleanings out of donated stuff. So the, the sorting process is you're going through all the stuff that comes in and you're identifying actual goods, items that will help the survivor recover um, and that are worth your uh, time and effort to move them through the management process. Um, you really need three potential sites depending upon the scale of your um, event. In many of the... Um, events that have occurred here in Virginia, a, a basic management system is sufficient where you have a collection center, a distribution center. Um, they can be either the same facility or maybe a different facility. Um, but in larger scale events, you have to increase and you need collection centers, distribution centers, and potentially multi-agency warehouses. And a distribution center, the definition is the distribu a, a distribution point for the goods to the public. Um, a multi-agency warehouse um, is where is going to be your in-between, um, between your collection center and your distribution point. I have another slide after this that will show that a little bit better. Um, and the warehouse is used to receive, unload, sort, inventory, and move unsolicited donations to a distribution center. It is also the point to which you receive inventory and move your solicited donations to, for NGO use. So when you have a large-scale event and you are in your short-term um, and intermediate-term um, recovery phase, your nonprofits, your, your voluntary organizations are going to be working to request from the private sector specific items that are needed for the recover, water, blankets, um, tarps, 
um, items like that, very specific items that they need in the recovery effort. That will come into your um, multi-agency warehouse and will have to be managed and inventoried um, along with all of the undesignated and unsolicited um, donations. So in a large, a very large scale event, um, you would see at the top of the screen you have your unsolicited donations. They come into collection centers. Um, and in this example, you have three. So they come into the collection centers. Um, at that point, you need, from a logistical perspective, you're going to need um, the ability to move and transport all that collected goods or collected stuff, excuse me, to your multi agency warehouse. Um, at the same time, there may be conversations going on between you, your voluntary sector that's working in your community, and the private sector um, for more specific targeted items. That will also come into your multi-agency warehouse. It goes through the process of inventorying um, and then sorting and uh, turning into goods to re return to the public. Then it turns back out, you'll see down towards uh, the second the second half of the page, the bottom half of the page, your distribution centers, um, where you're now shipping your items back out to the distribution centers, resetting those up, and then distributing them to the public. So in a very large-scale event, um, you need transportation, you need all the logistical support that will, will be required to run a warehouse. And at this point, I want to highlight that this is not something that you, as the local emergency manager, need to do. This is where you um, need to look to the voluntary sector to partner with, because there are organizations out there, um, and the go-to organization that I mention on a regular basis um, is Adventist Community Services. They are a, a national VOAD organization. They are a very strong Virginia VOAD organization. Um, and their area of expertise is donations management, is setting up your collection centers, is moving your stuff, turning it into goods, and distributing it to public. They can manage your warehouse for you. Um, they can manage your distribution process for you. Um, they will come into your community um, upon your request um, and will work with you and let you know, well, based on this event, um, we believe we're going to need you know, 20,000 square feet. Um, we think we need three collection centers and four distribution centers and a warehouse. Um, they're going to talk to you about some of the um, facility support needs, whether there's the need for... Um, uh, oh gosh, the name just left my, my mind, um, a forklift um, to m be able to move items more efficiently. Um, they will organize um, and bring in volunteers that are trained and skilled in management. Um, they will bring in volunteers that are trained in how to um, run a warehouse. And then this is also a, an area in which you can refer your unaffiliated volunteers um, to the Adventist or whomever you may choose um, to run the, org, run the warehouse for you. Um, so when you have your horde of um, un, unaffiliated uh, and untrained volunteers, you can refer them to, the, to the, your donation management system, and they can become your physical labor that goes through the sorting process and, and helps with your distribution. Um, so it can become very large or it can be very um, small. It really is going to be disaster um, and event specific. Um, it seems that a few questions have come in um, and I will go ahead and answer that before I go a little bit further. So let me look and see what some of these questions are here. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the last slides, one of the concerns you hear from the public is how can we ensure the money donated is used for the proposed uh, purpose intended? Um, how have you messaged in the past to address this and ease the public's concern, um, concern perception? Um, one of the best ways um, 
for. There is always a concern and a public perception that um, money is wasted. Um, you, they don't see the money returning to um, a community and helping with its recovery. Um, and a lot of that does have to do with the media attention because the media's attention will fall on an event primarily within the first several weeks. Um, and that's when the money's coming in, but the money's not being spent until later. Um, so you have to, in your messaging, explain that. Explain that the money you're you're sending to these organizations, um, they the individual donor needs to research who they want to give to. Um, do they want to give to the Red Cross? If they do, do they understand what the Red Cross does? What programs will they give? Do they want to give to um, the uh, United uh, Methodist Church, the Committee on Relief? Um, and do they understand what that organization does? Because they they can can target where they want their money to go based on what they believe the need to be. And the way you message um, and I do talk about this in the, the next section about cash, um, is that it's highly recommended that you always message to give to a VOAD organization. And you can give the National VOAD um, website, you can give the Virginia VOAD website, because those organizations are going to be primarily the ones that are going to come in and work with you. But if you have another organization that, that's not affiliated through the, the National or State VOAD, that is doing a lot of good in your community, and you see that as an emergency manager um, or local government, then feel free to say, you know, XYZ organization is here helping us manage um, the shelters. Please please provide them help to pay for the materials or, or re reimburse them or so that they can buy more materials for the next event. Um, so those are just some of the things, and it's, and it's about being honest and about being transparent. Um, I do go more into cash and that public perception a little bit more in the next section. Um, let me see another one here. Um, wow, there's a lot of questions here. I may need to uh, need, may need to wait for the break. Um, Lynette, you asked, what is the name of the organization? And it is the Adventist, A-D-V-E-N-T-I-S-T. So they're a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, and the disaster arm is Adventist Community Services. Um, and they're really just known amongst the voluntary world event, uh, uh, and in the emergency management, those of us who deal with volunteers and donations, as being one of the go-tos for... Uh, donations management. Um, Salvation Army also knows how to do it. Um, Red Cross, to a certain extent, um, knows how to do it, but Adventist are, are really known as one of the premiers. Um, okay, I'll move on. Some of these are just other messages. Um, so with your donation management, you know, pulling it all together, um, and I want to highlight that this webinar today is just one unit of a two-day training class. I'll give information about that training at the very end of this, uh, of, of this webinar. So this is just a very skimming of the surface a very high level, things that you need to consider and be prepared for. But if you're interested in knowing much more detail, I'll let you know when that, up, that upcoming training is. But during your preparedness phase, some of the things that you should um, be working on um, is knowing your team. Who is going to um, be your responsible organization? Who are you going to partner with? Um, and in this picture, you'll see the gentleman in the yellow. Um, that is an Adventist Community Service member. Um, those yellow, that bright yellow um, shirt, it kind of throws that off out to me. They really stand out. Um, and so in that event, they're using the Adventist to run it. So know your team, know who you're going to work with, um, whether it's Adventist, 
Salvation Army or another organization that you know of. Um, look at establishing MOUs um, and having um, some procedures in place so that you understand when, when do you pull the trigger, who's working with whom, where are you going. Um, also identifying um, where these facilities will be. Um, just like you identify in your plan where your shelters will be, um, it's important to look and, and look at your community and see where you can put collection centers. Collection centers don't necessarily have to be in vacant areas or vacant buildings. They could be in existing organizations or nonprofits that you work with in your community, such as your um, area um, food bank or um, your Red Cross chapter. Um, or a church that has regular um, consignment activities or um, clothes, clothes drives. Um, look to those organizations and see if they would be interested in serving as a collection center or even a distribution center um, and work that into your plan. And then the other is thinking about your public messaging. Um, the best thing that you can do is get the information out to the public um, before a disaster, during all your ready um, campaign efforts, that you know don't don't send items into a disaster area um, because they can become a hindrance to the emergency management community. Um, to wait for specific requests for items to come through and who those organizations are that should be asking. Um, in today's social media world, somebody will post a, a, a comment on Facebook and say, these people, we need coats for Hurricane Andrew survivors, and you don't need winter coats in Florida in August. So you just want to be able to um, control that uh, message beforehand and say, if there is a need for donated items, they will be posted on the county's website, on this organization's website, stand up an independent website for your recovery effort and put that information out there and then message that. Um, during your responses, again, activate your plan, manage your public information. You start seeing an influx of specific items, work to curb that. Um, information management, um, that's going to be, again, the communication between your um, managing organization, your emergency management community, um, and, and your community as a whole. Um, matching the needs. Uh, make sure that what you're, what's coming into your community is getting back out to their survivors. Um, is there a gap that may be in the process? Um, something that is needed um, that's not coming in, and then you can reach back out um, and, and ask for that. Um, and then always think with an eye towards recovery. Um, and then in recovery, um, you just understand that recovery is that you are in it for the long haul. It, recovery is a very, very long process, um, and there are many phases to recovery. Um, it's not like the traditional spectrum of emergency management where we have preparedness, response, um, recovery, and mitigation. Recovery has multiple phases and peaks and valleys of its own. Um, so it is a very long, drawn-out um, event, um, and it's, it's predicated on your disaster. Um, and understanding how do you make the transition from response to recovery, What's, what is that point? Um, transferring management from emergency management to um, your long-term recovery group, um, to your voluntary sector, to your community leaders, um, and how do you manage that? And then uh, with your public messaging, your appeal for long-term support, uh, appealing to the public to continue to help because it will take a long time to recover. Um, and then what is your after-action plan or process? So some things to think about when you look at your emergency operation plan and um, if you have an annex for donations management specifically, um, or maybe you have an annex that deals with both volunteers and donations, is do you have procedures um, in place for handling the influx of unsolicited goods? Um, if you don't, then, then you may want to consider putting some procedures in there. 
Um, do you have um, a list of mechanisms um, for locating collection centers or distribution centers? Um, who do you call? Who do you ask for? What's the trigger? Um, are they spread throughout your community? So if you have a disaster in the uh, western portion of your, your locality, um, you can stand everything up in the, the eastern portion. Have you designated um, a responsible um, party, um, an individual um, or organization that will manage the process for you? Um, and do you have the criteria in place for opening and closing um, collection and distribution centers? Um, so those are just some of the things that when you go back and you review your annex, see if you, you've answered all those questions. And if you haven't, then maybe that's an area that you can focus on um, and work at building that area of your um, annex and your plan out a little bit better. Um, so at this point, um, I will open up the lines for questions, but there's still a few, I believe, that are being written in here. Um, I hope that's a request if I will, let's see. All right, uh, if we want to open up the lines for questions, or actually I think I answered everything in the chat. Victoria, your line is unmuted. You can go ahead and ask your question. I just wondered if there will be um, any examples of the MOUs when you post the PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation? Um, I can send you, we have, um, I do have a sample MOU that is specifically with the Adventist Community Services. Um, mm -hmm. And you can use that and modify that directly with that organization or use that as a sample to go to another organization. So um, we can get that out to you. I'll send it to Erica, and she can distribute it back out to everyone. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Amanda, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. You need this. Hello. Hello. I hear somebody talking. Yes. Hey, Amanda. It's Bonnie up in Prince William. I uh, I couldn't figure out how to unmute my phone. Sorry. Okay. Um, I just, uh, in terms of the pets, just wanted to remind everybody that Virginia does have a state animal response team, and we have a few carts throughout um, the state, and that's also a good resource. And if you don't have a cart in your community, you might want to consider starting one. We've got all kinds of resources on the SART website. Great. Um, and that was a little bit low, so I'm not sure if everyone heard Bonnie. Um, but that was about CART. Um, and Bonnie, you may need to help my acronym, but it's the Community Animal Response Team, um, which helps with um, all of your domestic um, animals in a disaster response and into recovery period. Right. So if you and don't have one, there's a, a CART website, and, and Bonnie, um, um, they have one up in, in Northern Virginia, so Bonnie knows about that one. Well, it's a, it's a state organization, and we are Virginia VOAD members. So um, okay. you, you go on, it's um, vasart.org, and it's the Virginia State Animal Response Team. And there's all kinds of resources. Yep. Okay, so the next um, section, and some people earlier in the chat were asking and making comments about cash, so hopefully in this next area um, we'll talk a little bit, we'll, I'll, I'll be able to answer some of those questions here. Um, so undesignated cash, that's kind of where my area of expertise, I'm much more comfortable in the world of money. Um, my background with Louisa um, is that we stood up a local recovery fund um, very quickly after the earthquake. Um, having come from local government um, and we're having seen the how a long-term recovery group works and operates, um, I really am a proponent and a supporter of establishing local recovery funds. Um, but it's not for everyone. Um, I, I do very much see the value in them. They, they are hard work. 
Um, they require a, a very high level of transparency um, and coordination, but I do see the value of them. So I, I'm a little bit biased, and you'll you'll probably hear that in this overall organ this overall presentation. Um, I'm a little biased towards local recovery funds um, or relief funds, however you choose to name them. Um, but the the key thing is to understand that cash is important. Cash is going to go so much farther than any of the other work that can be done because it can be targeted. You get exactly what you need, um, and and it's just going to. It's much easier to manage money um, than it is to manage um, goods and materials. Um, much more economically feasible, um, and you get a higher return on that investment in managing money than you do in managing all of the materials. Um, here. So why is cash preferred? It's, it's really preferred because it, it can go, it can help voluntary organizations, money. In your messaging, you can say, please give, um, if you want to give and help the survivors of um, Hurricane uh, Christy Bell, um, if you want to help with Hurricane Christy recovery, please give money to um, a VOAD organization because they are here helping. And go to um, virginiavoad.org and look at all the organizations that are a member of that and choose. You can make that message because those organizations are going to come in and help you. If you want to in your messaging say, um, we have the Virginia Baptist, we have Islamic Relief, we have the Red Cross, and we have the Salvation Army helping with Hurricane Christie recovery, please give to them. That's your choice to make those message points. Um, it also, um, and that gives those organizations the ability to meet very specific needs because they are there in your community. They know what's needed. They know if there's um, a need for tarps. They know if there's a need for food. They know um, they can help with clothing um, and give um, targeted vouchers to help people go buy clothes. Um, that's a much larger picture of recovery where it helps to stimulate the uh, local economy again if they're going out and buying things. Um, so money just really helps to grease that engine again and get it moving um, moving forward. Um, it allows for um, the equitable uh, dis uh, distrib disbursement procedures and standard accounting procedures. Um, and it also provides a lot of support, depending upon where you target your money, um, to long-term recovery efforts and committees. And it's just so much more efficient to inventory cash than it is stuff. You know, you need one or two. You need one person to, you know, bring the money in. Another person to um, verify. You've got a few controls, financial controls that you want to put in place. But in reality, you're talking about a handful of people that have to manage some spreadsheets and some paperwork and and, and cut checks um, versus you know dozens or hundreds of people and thousands of hours to manage materials. Um, so which cash recipients are best? Um, so the National VOAD um, has established guidelines that does say to always encourage donations to VOAD organizations or voluntary organizations, your nonprofits that are helping in your community. Um, because not all um, helping organizations that may be working in your community um, are VOAD organizations, and I very much understand that having come from a smaller rural um, community. Um, we had a number of um, organizations um, that were very specific to our locality and maybe one other county um, that did a lot in our recovery. So we did recommend that people give to that very specific um, foundation um, to help them with their operating expense because they put a lot in. It would help them recover their own um, finances to be able to continue operating um, or the work they could purchase directly to help with the recovery. So 
I, you know, I do deviate a little bit because I do understand that you're going to have some helping organizations that you as an emergency manager, you know your community, you know your group, you can refer to more specific targeted organizations. Um, so, and many of those organizations, especially amongst the, the VOAD organizations, is they have a disaster relief fund. Um, they already have existing funds and processes in place um, to accept and manage um, donations. Some of your smaller organizations, maybe a local church, they're not disaster specific. They may be community um, support or community service specific, um, but it's not disaster relief. Um, and it is a different process. So th that's just some of the things that you need to think about. Um, and then one of the things that you will need to decide very early on um, e in your event, and really you want to work, write this into your plan, um, is will your community and will your locality establish a disaster relief fund? Um, sometimes they're referred to as the mayor's fund, um, um, but really it is a uh, local um, relief fund that is affiliated and connected to the government and the emergency management response, um, but it is um, through a fiscal agent, um, and that fiscal agent then begins to work with your long-term recovery group. Um, so I do, this is again just me advocating because I've been through it, um, I do very much see the benefit of having a local um, community relief fund um, working with your long-term recovery group um, because you can set up very specific policies um, and procedures on how to spend that money and help your community recover in a very targeted way. Um, so some of the things that you need to understand, there are some localities that um, want to establish a local government fund versus a voluntary organization or a um, kind of partner fiscal agent fund. Um, and some of the things that you need to take into account of whether you want to, one, direct it just to the voluntary sector, or you want to create this hybrid um, partnership between the voluntary sector and the local government, or if you want to establish a local government fund. So the management is an organization um, already has predetermined staffing that is set aside for um, development, for fundraising. They know how to bring money in. They know how they have a um, system in place. They have a database in place that can capture the donor's information, how much the donation was. They have controls in place to, um, to manage that money. Um, and the local government may not you have very specific finance um, functions with accounting and accounts payable and accounts receivable, um, but you don't necessarily or may not have the staffing available to manage donations um, and how to give you know, tax credits and uh, thank you letters um, and stewardship to that donor. Um, some of the processes is that an organization, a voluntary organization, already has um, such as um, thank yous. Um, once a donation comes in, they enter it into the system, a thank you letter is generated. Um, the local government would have to develop that process. It would have to develop um, controls. It would have to develop um, where money would be deposited, how is it going to be transferred, how will it be appropriated, um, distribution or disbursement of the funds, um, again, an organization has those established guidelines. A local government would have to develop that. Additionally is that when you think about money that comes into a local government, you have to take into consideration appropriation. Um, so whenever funds come into the um, government, um, they have to be appropriated by the governing body um, before they can be expended. Um, they are under the governing body's control um, they can move that around. Um, so those are just some of the things that have to be considered, um, as well as that once money comes under the local government control, um, a, uh, uh, procurement rules will go into place. 
Whereas if money goes into a, an organization, they don't have to follow government procurement rules. So those are just some of the things to consider of whether or not your locality wants to stand up its own uh, independent fund for your recovery or relief. Um, and then accountability. Um, the, the organizations know when and what needs to be reported to the IRS, to donors, um, how do you send your tax receipt and all of that. They have their 990s. Um, and the local government may not necessarily know that. Um, and when it comes to audit time, they could get in trouble because they simply just don't know. Not necessarily advocating that your local government doesn't stand up its own fund, but I do believe that there are other and, and better, more efficient ways um, out there that you can work with the voluntary sector in either directing the money right to them, let them manage it, or partnering with them in creating a uh, community recovery fund and, and working through the recovery together. Um, I put this slide in here because earlier on I, I mentioned um, that uh, recovery is a, a very long, drawn-out process um, and that it has multiple phases. And this uh, picture uh, or image comes from the National um, disaster recovery framework and and I think it's I personally think it's one of the best images because it talks about it shows you your your preparedness um, your disaster and how it has all its little peaks and valleys very quickly and it's it's, it's over ra ra relatively quickly and then you move into your recovery phases you've got your short-term recovery your intermediate recovery and your long term and it shows how they overlap over a period of time um, and this, to me, just highlights how cash is going to be so important in your community's recovery because it is going to take a long time. And you don't want the cash to run out and then the recovery to stop. Um, and then, then you, you just aren't able to continue on and you, you hit a roadblock. So it's important to, to understand the big picture that um, it's not all going to get done in the first 30 days or 90 days. Um, it's going to be um, disaster specific um, and it's going to be months and years. Um, Hurricane Sandy recovery um, is a year past going on its two year anniversary um, and there are still, still a considerable amount of work um, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans is, is going on its 10-year anniversary. And again, a lot of work that needs to be done in those communities. Um, so money is still very important in those recovery efforts. Um, so for cash and long-term recovery, the funds can go into an account um, if you choose to make a, uh, a partnership um, where you're in your plan, you say, okay, we want to have a fiscal agent. We, we know we're going to stand up a long-term recovery group. We're going to work with our voluntary sector um, and, and our VOAD organizations to build a, a long-term recovery group. We need money for them to be able to carry out their mission. Um, we are going to turn to um, mom and pop foundation and ask them to serve as the fiscal agent. Um, so that money can go into an account. Some of the examples I have is a, is a ministerial association. It can be a VOAD organization. You can turn to um, Virginia Baptist or, or uh, Salvation Army or, or whoever you may have a relationship in your community. Um, maybe your uh, volunteer centers, um, whoever may be a nonprofit in your community and ask them to set up an account. Um, United Way is another good example. Um, that was the partner um, that uh, Southwest Virginia and Washington County um, turned to um, and asked them to stand up and serve as fiscal agent for their long-term recovery group um, and for that recovery fund. Um, so United Way is a good option, um, and many of them know how to do that because they manage a lot of different funds. Um, or any other nonprofit organization. Um, our recovery in Louisa County was very much a housing recovery. Um, we knew that right off the bat. Um, we, as a local government, had a very close relationship with the Louisa Housing Foundation, which is a nonprofit. Um, so we turned to them immediately and asked them to serve as fiscal agent um, and set up an account. 
um, and put the funds in, into there for us to, to use through the long-term recovery effort. Um, and it worked wonderfully. Um, and funds can then be directed, once you have it into a, an account, um, you can develop a policy that either the money will be managed by or expended by your long-term recovery group, um, or it can then be directed to other long, nonprofits um, involved in long-term recovery. Um, so if you, through your um, long-term recovery group, are doing a housing recovery um, and you identify that the Virginia Baptist Mission Board is able to carry out the work um, as far as the labor on a housing rehabilitation, but they need money to buy the materials. Your long-term recovery group can di direct those monies to the Virginia Baptist to buy the materials to help with that recovery. Um, so you can really determine how that money gets, gets funneled and gets used. Um, and they can, and, and it's very targeted to your, and, it's, and specific to your community's recovery. Um, so some of the things to consider and to think about that if you do have a donations management um, annex, um, or again, some of you may have a combination of volunteer and donation management, um, is that do you state your assumptions about cash? Do you say right there in your plan, we local government do not want the money, we will direct it to VOAD organizations? Done. That's your plan. Or do you state that you will partner with the United Way to establish a relief fund? Um, or do you want to stand up your own local uh, government-managed fund? Um, have you stated that in your, um, in your plan? Um, and then what is the policy um, in place for th those things? If you're just saying send it to a VOAD, you're done. If you're saying we want to partner in some way, you're going to need to develop some policies um, on how it's managed. Um, and then what is your process for referring um, to various voluntary organizations? Do you uh, blanket and say we, Virginia VOAD, send it to them, send it to those organizations? Or do you um, make the decision that we will specify, we will ask that they identify themselves when they come into the community, we want to know which organizations are helping, and that's who we will list and say, please give donations to these 10 organizations who are here today helping us. Um, so those are some of the considerations that you um, should have um, in your annex. Uh, so in summary, um, we have really talked both during the um, donations management or the, the unsolicited donations as well as the cash donations um, why cash is really the best, um, why it's the most economically feasible. It's targeted. It, it, it starts to rebuild your local economy, um, and it helps move um, everyone as a whole community closer to that end goal of, of full recovery. Um, so we talked about the, the, the list of locations that you should be considering um, for your donations management uh, system and defining the uses and purposes of those, collection center, distribution center, and multi-agency warehouse. Um, we've talked about the requirements for your collection centers and those different things, um, and why cash is the best of all potential donations, um, and then talked a little bit about the process of referring cash to appropriate funds. Um, so do we have any more questions? I saw again through the chat um, that we had some more questions posted. Um, And I see, okay, so I'm glad. I was not familiar with SART, and, and Bonnie said SART, and I thought CART. Um, so it's Virginia S-A-R-T, State Animal Response Team, um, and that was in the chat for everyone to see. Um, another question, what if the money is set up through a local bank? Um, I'm not quite sure 
what that question entails. Um, so if the person that asked that one, if you might be able to get online and give me a little bit of a better idea of what you mean by that question. To be put through a local bank, and then that bank actually receives the money, and then once it is collected or cut off date, then that money is sent wherever it's needed. Um, it, that, that really sounds to be almost the same process of you partnering. You're turning to the bank to act, act as your fiscal agent. Um, yeah. So there still needs to be some sort of um, management team or oversight team. There's still going to be the need for um, policies in place on how it's distributed, who gets to write the checks. Um, the challenge, I'm not saying that local bank is not a good option, it's definitely an option, but if money is sent directly to a bank, there's no tax incentive for the donor. So if they, if you partner with a nonprofit, or if, a, or a, or if the money goes directly to a nonprofit, whether it's through a, a, a government voluntary sector partnership or directly to the voluntary sector, there's a tax benefit to the donor. Um, not all donors think that way, but there is a benefit um, to to the person who's giving money um, that it's a charitable donation. Um, if the money yeah, goes into a charitable donation, I'm sorry. It would still be a charitable donation. It's just that the bank itself is holding and doing the transactions, and then that money is then giving to that charitable donation to that charity. Who is who is the charity through which they're giving it to? It, it, it could be the Red Cross. It could be okay. uh, whoever. So but basically, banks yes, are used you sometimes turn, as a holding agent. Yes. So that that's correct. But the money still has to go through an organization. Um, so you still have to have somebody that's quote unquote your fiscal agent. Whether the money goes into a local bank and that local bank says we're not going to charge you any fees, um, you know that that's more of a process um, than than a partnership. Okay. Does that make sense, Gene? Yes. Yes. Okay. And we did that in Louisa. We went to our local community bank. We the government partnered with the Louisa Housing Foundation. The Housing Foundation was the fiscal agent. The actual account where the money went was to Virginia Community Bank and was held in an independent account. Um, and the bank waived all fees and, and didn't didn't do anything, you know, to help with, with all of that. So right, we yeah, did that, have that level thinking. of partnership, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. If anybody else has any question, there's a little button that says raise hand. If you want to click that, raise your hand, and um, Erica will unmute your line. All right, not seeing anyone. Um, as I mentioned, management, we really get into depth um, to all of the nuances of, of volunteer management. And when I talk about volunteer, it's the unaffiliated volunteer um, and donations management, how the two systems and two programs work together, um, how they support your overall mission and emergency management, um, how you partner with the voluntary sector, which organizations um, are there to help you, some of the premier organizations that are out there that have very specific um, uh, purposes that, that fall within these two worlds, uh, volunteer and donations management. So it's a two-day training. Today's hour webinar isn't even really scratching the surface of one unit. Um, so that's October 14th and 15th in, in Manassas. Um, if you're interested in that, um, go on to the Knowledge Center um, and look up G288, and you can register for that um, class. 
um, my contact information. I am here at VDEM, uh, available anytime. Uh, Amanda Reidelbach dot Reidelbach at VDEM dot Virginia dot org. Um, this is my uh, cell phone number. Um, so please feel free to call me uh, anytime if you've got any questions. Um, if you want me to come to um, your locality, if you want me to review your plans, um, I would love to help you um, in any way. So just be, know that I'm a, a resource here for you. Um, I'm also open to learning and, and seeing what everybody has planned. Um, I've read a few annexes and a few um, plans for different localities. It's very interesting to see um, how different counties have uh, planned for volunteers and donations. So um, would love to read your plan or help you um, build your plan. Um, so feel free to contact me anytime. Um, thank you.